so I am not an architect. I am not a great storyteller. Uh, I'm a behavioral scientist. Um, I, I work at the University of Illinois in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health. My training is in uh, psychology, specifically exercise psychology. Um, so actually, ever since uh, Phil's talk, I have been, like my mind has been blown thinking about um, uh, focus and fire. And in fact, um, this talk, may have been uh, better coming immediately after that because uh, what I'm most interested in is the beneficial effects of sauna on the mind, on cognition. Um, but I started out looking at the effects of exercise on the brain and uh, exercise has similar um, you know, thermoregulatory effects. Um, so really that's, that's where we're gonna go. I'm, I'm not gonna cover the whole elephant. This could have been called um, <laughs> sweat bathing and physical and cognitive benefits. Okay, now you have to tell me what I'm doing here. Is uh, it? Yeah. Click on this. Okay, let me get over to it. And uh, so it's down here and I click where? There? Yep. This thing? Okay, <laughs> got it, that's easy. <laughs> um, so very quickly, I mean, I, I'm gonna cover an overview of thermoregulation and acclimation to heat stress. Um, so I, I'm going to refer to it as heat stress, any sort of environmental stressor um, it can have that, that effect. It doesn't really matter if it's a sauna or um, a sweat lodge. Um, I'm going to talk about some myths and misconceptions. Uh, Miko wanted me to talk about that. Um, basically, I'm going to cover what the, the research says. and. What I hold is the gold standard of evidence is randomized controlled trials. Um, certainly, you guys know it works. I know it works for my personal use. I've only been an avid sauna goer for the past five years. Um, but uh, Stephen tells me it's in my blood. The Irish have the oldest, me the megaliths. Well. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. The oldest, the best. <laughs> I mean, we're going to get some fights going here, I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'll wrap up with just a, a glimpse of the future of my research, um, exploring the beneficial effects of sauna combined with exercise. Mm -hmm. okay. So thermoregulation, what is it? It's the, the process through which our, our body regulates heat. Um, we're pretty inefficient at it. Um, the key players are the hypothalamus, um, the pituitary gland, you know, we've got 2.6 million uh, eccrine sweat glands. Um, we also have apocrine sweat glands, but they react to um, emotional stress, like sweating from the armpits instead of from the, um, from the actual heat. Um, so it's, a, it's an evaporative cooling process that allows us to, to cool our bodies down. Um, we operate and we can function well up to about 39.5, 40 degrees centigrade or um, under, you know, 103.1 Fahrenheit. Um, much higher than that, we can start to do irreparable harm. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're not really in the sauna that long and, and we take ourselves out. We have uh, four brains, you know, to tell us you know, it's time to get out. Um, acclimation to heat usually takes about five to seven days. So for those of us that are avid users, we, you know, we're going once or twice a week. Um, you know, it, it takes a little while before the, the sweat sets in. Our set point is a little bit higher. Um, but for those of us um, that, that go irregularly, we're not capitalizing on all the benefits because you can actually sweat more about 50 15% more um, if you're going regularly and you ha have acclimated. So some of the uh, you know, basic uh, changes as a function of heat stress are acute uh, circulatory changes. So um, the, the most pronounced is the increase in blood volume. Um, so that just means greater oxygenated blood delivered to the periphery. Um, there's less peripheral resistance and more elasticity in the blood vessels. Um, and that's believed to be due to uh, 
uh, endothelial cells that are aligning all of your blood vessels, you know, from capillaries to arteries. Um, interestingly enough, exercise has, uh, you know, parallel effects in this area. Um, blood pressure actually doesn't change all that much. There's a little bit of a reduction in diastolic, uh, but when you add exercise, there's systolic and diastolic changes in addition to ambulatory blood pressure. Um, overall, the effect is improved uh, economy of the, the heart function. There's a number of hormonal changes. There's a cascade of things that happens. Um, noradrenaline, which is responsible for improved alertness. Uh, adrenocortical uh, hormone, you know, that, that's responsible for a number of metabolic changes, uh, protein uh, catabolism. Cortisol is released into the blood and, and changes blood sugar. Um, it's also re responsible for a suppression in the immune system and in inflammatory changes. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is when you're acclimated to heat, you can tolerate it more. And when you can tolerate it more, you can sweat more and it feels better. And you can actually work under more or hotter temperatures. Um, I mentioned Ms. One of the Ms. that um, you know used to be about uh, temperature and heat was that uh, human beings could not withstand heat at the boiling point of water. Well, we proved them wrong. And NASA once thought that we couldn't re-enter uh, you know the Earth's atmosphere because the temperatures were just too hot. We found ways to acclimate to that. Um, as the climate changes, I think saunas are going to be extremely important to allow us to <laughs> acclimate to that. <laughs> Whoa. There we go. There's a headline. <laughs> but, you know, it's important to note that there are a number of myths associated with um, sauna use that have been uh, found to be untrue, uh, most notably the uh, neural tube deficits um, in terms of, uh, you know, anencephaly, um, basically the brain and the cranium forms, uh, it, there's a disruption there. Um, and that was a myth. I don't know where that started. Uh, I never heard of it before, actually, until I started researching this. But um, if you just look at the Finnish culture, when they start them uh, from yay big, and it, there's <laughs> Six months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and there's there's still uh, a birthing in saunas. So um, you know it, the the findings just don't pan out there. Um, in terms of children and older adults, we know that their thermoregulatory functioning is uh, less stable than young adults, middle-aged adults that are a, a bit healthier. Um, however, it, you know, there's no findings that are jumping out and saying uh, they really shouldn't get that type of heat exposure. Now, cardiac patients have been told to avoid heat altogether. Um, but there's actually evidence to refute this directly because sauna has been shown to improve cardiac function in patients with congestive heart failure, untreated hypertension, people that just got out of um, surgery. So, uh, you know, it, and those are based on randomized control trials. Question? Yeah. Um, as far as myth what about Wait, that would be Greg over there. <laughs> it does lower sperm count, right? That's I, <laughs> yeah. From from what I've read, uh, changes in the way they swim certainly. Uh, that. Well, they that lead to like birth defect or something, or no? No, no, it just lowers the sperm count. And that's temporary. Once you deacclimate, it goes. So right don't back use it for birth control. That's what he said. Yeah. Mountain Dew is better for that. Um, it, it, there, there are some populations that should stay away from heat. Okay, these are people that either can't control the rate at which they sweat, 
um, or they have some sort of neurodegenerative damage, uh, so they are more likely to seize. So for example, uh, anhydrotic uh, ectodermal dysplasia is um, a disorder that you are born with, it's congenital, and you may have a, a section of your body that doesn't have sweat glands, or your entire body may not. Um, hyperhidrosis, it's more than just sweaty hands. My wife has it, she goes in the sauna, but uh, hyperhidrosis is sweating pretty much everywhere uncontrollably. Cystic fibrosis is uh, characteristic of people that have a lot of phlegm in here, and um, they're, they're actually able to tolerate the heat. However, um, they're unable to have a reuptake with sodium chloride, and therefore they have to constantly have salt tablets. Um, multiple sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disorder. It uh, is defined by you know, changes in the myelin sheath and the neurons. So when that happens, um, signals get messed up and you're more likely to, to have a seizure. Okay, and then there are some really rare conditions that are affected by um, anesthesia. So people come out of that and are unable to regulate heat. We know how to safely use saunas. Um, basically, just don't skip meals. Be hydrated, okay? Avoid excessive sauna bathing, and I would characterize that as more than five days a week, more than those three cycles, okay, for 20 minutes and cooling off. If you're doing it much more than that, it's hard to keep up with the hydration, meaning you have to really drink about 20 to 24 ounces of water per pound of body weight lost, otherwise you're in a dehydrated state. I'm thirsty right now and I'm already in a dehydrated state. Hydrated, yes. Um, avoid alcohol. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna get it. You know, I, I I'm not we're getting that here. I don't think yeah. I'm getting that here, but. Um, to move to the next slide. <laughs> the, the evidence would suggest that it's probably riskier, okay? Um, also, if you have a nicotine patch or some other type of transdermal drug, uh, it's just gonna accelerate delivery throughout your body. Uh, if you don't want that, don't do it. Okay. Um, ACSM, that's American College of Sports Medicine. Uh, they don't have a position statement on saunas. I looked, I wanted to find one, but um, we can adopt their recommendations for uh, hydration. Essentially, you should be like we're all doing or have been doing, drinking that water all the way up to that sweat session. Um, I, I've seen people measure out the stuff and water, you know, as long as you're not feeling thirsty um, and you're continually sipping throughout and you replenish within about two hours after the sweat session, you should be fine. Um, stop signs, <laughs> we all know what they are. You know, we feel it, we feel dehydrated, we feel cramps coming on, that's when it's time to get out. Um, we got a group here that, <laughs> yeah. that knows that stuff. Now, there are only a handful of randomized control trials. What is an RCT? That's when you flip a coin and you decide who's going to get what. Okay, so an RCT with a, a sauna program is going to have, you know, no sauna or some sort of control group that is um, meeting people with the exact same amount of time in contact. Um, GATA looked at a group of untreated folks with hypertension. Now, all of these were very, very small samples. Um, they only did two sessions, okay? Um, and this was a dry sauna, and they compared it to a group that got dry sauna plus exercise and physical therapy. Um, they found that this group had uh, improved hemo hemodynamic function, they had um, improvements in uh, heart rhythm and, and regularity, um, but it was, you know, most pronounced in the group that had that exercise therapy. 
Um, but both groups actually improved as a function of just two sessions. Um, the exercise portion was not a big component, maybe 20 to 30 minutes of resistance and aerobic training. Um, these others, FIRT stands for far infrared therapy. Um, this is not the same thing. Um, I'm not a, a big fan, even though I have uh, technology in this other part of what I do. Um, in, in terms of using it as a heating element, uh, I don't think it's been around long enough to really know the, the side effects. Certainly tanning is a, you know, infrared technology and look at, you know, what that's shown. Um, but for what it's worth, uh, there have been more RCTs in this area looking at groups with um, clinical issues. CHF is chronic heart failure. Uh, they had 14 sessions and improved, um, or reduced the irregularities in um, the ventric ventricular contractions. Uh, Masuda has done an, a lot of work in Japan looking at this technology and um, using frequent sessions within the span of you know, two to four weeks. And they started looking at psychological functioning. Uh, changes in mental complaints, depression, um, hormones that are um, related to appetite suppressant, uh, so like ghrelin. And all of that improved as a function of the, the infrared therapy. Um, oh, sorry, sir. That's all right. Um, I don't know how to go back. Is it this? Yep. Okay. Can you go? Yeah. One? In terms of chronic pain, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a former tennis player. I have had chronic back pain for the past two weeks. Um, and, you know, the sauna is my savior for that. And basically they, they found that um, there were huge reductions in perceptions of pain. Um, I'm gonna yep. jump in just a second. Because yep. there's something that just come, and we have, you know, compressed sure. time here. And there's a couple things that just keep popping into my head. And you're, you're bringing up these studies now, which, and. I, I, that's great, mm -hmm. but how serious are people taking this in out in the world? Is this these are small studies here and there? Is it something that that people are interested in studying or not? It, it really seems to me that there's not that much interest in general to this in this subject. Is that true or not? I'm trying to change that. Well, I understand <laughs> yeah, you're trying to change, yeah. it, but what is the what, what happens when you go and try to get a study like this going? What, um, what, what kind of resistance are you having to it? A great deal. Um, that's what's interesting. I mean, it's really, yeah, sure. that's the kind of thing we want to, you know, as a group, kind of think about. Why, why, is it, why aren't we getting better data, more information about what's actually happening with the body? Well, there's a, an institute, that, um, the National Institute of, let me get this right, um, Complementary and it. Uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Alternative Medicines. That they, they would be most apt to fund something like this, um, but funding in that center is a, a lot less relative to, say, NCI, National Cancer Institute. Um, I have federal funding through the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute right now for a, a separate line of work, and I'm hoping to go back at them with some of my pilot data. Um, but in the community, it's very difficult to do this type of stuff because they're afraid that we're gonna bring in a, a population that's not gonna be able to endure the heat. They also have their own patrons that they don't want research people doing their own business and having them feel like, you know, they, they can't go in the sauna uh, and, you know, do their thing. There are members there and I don't have my own facility. I would love to build one. <laughs> <laughs> How much does that cost? Okay. Um, so Go ahead, wait, yeah. go ahead. I want to break, Sean, I don't want yeah. to, I know you have these slides prepared, sure. but we need to Absolutely. move it along. And I really, yeah. I know a lot of people are feeling like I do, that they want to kind of get some information yeah. here, specific. I, I just would like to say here that when looking back at the International Solar Congresses and uh, those different presentations, so starting from the early 50s, so until about 2000, there were a lot of uh, presentations about sauna and the medical so medical doctors, mm -hmm. and basically they came from Europe and especially from uh, the previous Eastern Europe. And uh, for the last sort of 
for the last uh, few congresses, so there has not been uh, really uh, any interesting research work shown. And for example, now for the next Congress, which is happening end of May, so we have basically two uh, presentations which are going to cover sauna and, and medical effects of sauna. And at least in, in uh, Europe, I know that the financing has been practically impossible. Right. Finland typically was one of the leading countries, and we have not been doing in Finland after 96 anything. So it's, it's not only in this country that we're having trouble. You want, go ahead. The, the conventional wisdom, uh, I'm Jeanette Wagemaker Schiff. I, when I did my uh, PhD at Columbia, uh, the first thing that we were cautioned about was the fact that if you wanted to do a research study, make sure that it was at the, at the leading edge of what was then, of what is considered currently fashionable. And if it's not, if it is not considered politically, and scientifically fashionable, you can have the best study in the world, but you will not get funding. So you have a huge political uh, weight. And uh, it, this is not just a, a US phenomenon, because the same thing exists in Canada. And I'd be willing to uh, venture that the same thing exists in the European countries. Yeah. So we're not talking about a topic that has a whole lot of political clout at the moment. And so if that doesn't get turned around, then you have to look at private foundations that may have a niche interest in promoting this kind of research. The yeah. US military was doing uh, quite a lot of things uh, in the 80s and still in the 90s. The military was, yeah. yeah. No, not only in the 80s and 90s, but uh, Maybe no. during World War uh, One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, before World War and during World War Two on the pilots, Department of Navy, and, and maybe you are familiar with Sidney Licht work. Mm -hmm. Sidney Licht on medical hydrology. So we can talk about this. Okay. The break yep. in the university. Okay, we, we've just kind of, I gotta jump in. We, we really have just a short time right now before lunch, and I have, we have four more presentations to go before lunch. <laughs> Don't worry, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is. I know you're going to be here for two days, so yep. you're going to participate in this discussion. Sure. It's going to come up. Uh, we have some really interesting presentation tomorrow. Of somebody from uh, Silicon Valley is going to come up and talk about personal monitoring devices, uh, how that can revolutionize, revolutionize the whole, uh, you know, the studies that can be done on, on wide scale, um, wide scale basis based on individuals with these monitoring devices, which you know, is the, the rage now, wearable computing. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff is gonna be talked about. So I wanna, you know, I wanna, we're gonna, you're gonna continue talking, but right now let me just move on to the, to the next speaker. Is that okay? Sure. John, you're good? Good? That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you.